Good evening. Welcome to your Thursday evening stroll around your celestial neighborhood. I'm Irene Pease, your friendly neighborhood astronomer out of New York City, Brooklyn in particular, and I'm excited to look at the winter skies tonight. Winter actually happens to be my favorite celestial season. Not a huge fan of the cold. There's a reason I moved away from Wisconsin. Thank you very much. But the celestial sites that are out in the northern winter are mostly my favorites of the whole night sky. So excited to tell you exactly why, like what you should be looking for, what you should be looking forward to tonight. So the visuals, as usual, will be using Stellarium, uh, which you can find at stellarium.org and also Open Space, which you can see in the background now, and that you can find and download for free and play around with it to your heart's content, openspaceproject.com. So as usual, tonight we're going to start off with kind of what's going on, what's happening in the night sky now, and then we'll get more into what's going to be happening over the next few months, over our next season, the northern winter. I'm not going to say northern winter every single time I say winter tonight, but just assume I'm in Brooklyn. Brooklyn's in the northern hemisphere, so I'm talking about winter in the northern hemisphere, summer for all the folks down under. So let's pop on over to Stellarium and see what we have. Looks like it's dark outside, folks. Um, not too shocking because we are super close to the winter solstice. So less than a week away from our northern winter solstice. A very exciting. Let me just pop a clock in here. And we can see, I can't even see the tree. I don't think there's a tree. I think there's a mountain somewhere. It's not actually this dark in Brooklyn. For those of you who have been to New York City, live in New York City, been to any really bright city, you know it's not quite this dark, but we're going to pretend because it's fun. So what's happening in the sky this week in particular? Oh, I don't know. I guess there's some planets up there somewhere. Uh, let me just rewind time a little bit. So before now, back when the sun was getting busy setting, there were some planets and oh, the moon is up. That's exciting. Um, but there's two planets and I don't know if I've, I've only been talking about this like every single week for a while now. Um, and it's finally, it's finally here. Um, I might not actually talk about it next week. Actually, next week is mission of the month. Um, and so I won't be talking about the planets. I'll be talking about the moon and one of the Apollo missions, a Christmas Eve Apollo mission for you. So what's happening next week and this week and yeah, over the next several days, well, the planets... Uh, they're getting really close. So it's the great conjunction of 2020. Finally, upon us. I've been waiting all year for this. This is what 2020 has been leading up to. Not really, but if only. So right now, they're pretty close together in the night sky over the next few nights. Let me see if I can stay on Jupiter. Over the next few nights, they'll get closer and closer and closer together and no, they're not going to actually smack into each other because they're actually very different distances from each other in space. Jupiter's a lot closer to us than Saturn, but they get very, very close. Um, I actually have a cute little image of that I can show in a moment, um, but that's the excitement. Uh, super exciting if you live somewhere where it's going to be clear. New York City area looking like not so much, but you never know. Apparently, there's a cloud zapper somewhere in New Jersey. Um, thanks for the tip, Brian. I appreciate that. Um, so if you happen to be <laughs> staffing a cloud zapper, cloud blaster, whatever, if you can operate that thing safely and blast away some of our clouds, especially for the 21st, because this only happens, you know, every, yeah, it's kind of a once in a lifetime or even less often. Um, the next one like this will be in 2080. I don't know if I'm going to be around for that. Here's hoping. Anyway, watch the planets this week. That's that's your challenge. Not so much a challenge. That's your that's your task. Watch the planets. Tomorrow night is looking like the best weather for the New York City area, but really from tonight uh, through the next week or so, those are going to be really close. Basically, closer than a full moon. Uh, to show you that, uh, let me pop on over to uh, to open space for just a moment. I have a, a nifty. A thing I made. This is what I did on Friday or Saturday or whichever day it was. I don't. They all kind of blur together at this point. Um, this, right? So I made this. <laughs> so this isn't what it's going to look like in the sky because it's not going to be anywhere near a full moon as we just saw. But just to compare, like how close are we talking about when we say close? We see basically closer than 
like the size of the full moon in our sky, right? So again, um, here we are on the 17th. Um, oh, that's today, I think. My brain isn't really functioning, so I'm just kind of guessing here. The 18th, the 19th, there's a little Saturn, a little Jupiter, 20th, the 21st, they're like really, really close in there. But all from tonight through about Christmassy time, um, they're going to be closer together, close enough together that they would fit basically in the space of a, of a full moon in the sky. So that's pretty close, right? That'll make for some really beautiful pictures. No pressure, all you astrophotographers out there. So that's this week. And uh, after that, after the actual solstice, what else do we have to look forward to? Is there, should we just like stay inside for the rest of the winter? I mean, stay safe, obviously. Don't like go to, you know, raging parties uh, where there's lots of germs and stuff. But, <laughs> but you should still go outside and look and see other exciting things because it's winter time. So the winter sky, again, is one of my favorites. Uh, it has basically some of the some of the best of almost every object um, in the sky. So when I say like different types of objects, astronomers look at different, what we call deep sky objects. So we have uh, clusters and nebulae and galaxies. And really, I think the winter sky has some of the best of almost all of those, almost every type of object. I would say the best or one of the top ones is in the winter sky, right? So we do have one planet. The planets are kind of, they, that varies from one year to the next. Uh, just, you know, off the, just kind of uh, to get it out of the way, Mars, very exciting. Uh, but Mars is going to be the main planet that's out this winter. So if you like Mars, great. Um, it's going to be getting smaller, fainter as it gets further away from us. So not as exciting, but see if you can, you know, still pick out some features. And also Mars is kind of interesting because at the end of the winter in March, when we're coming up on our vernal equinox, we'll have not one, not two, but three missions that are currently on their way to Mars that will be arriving in February uh, and, and early March. So that's going to be an exciting time. So all through the winter, there's stuff on its way to Mars from uh, NASA, from China, and from the UAE. So we'll see those all arriving towards the end of the winter. So that's kind of like, if you want to just track those online, you can't really see them in a telescope because they're really, really small, the little probe things. Um, you might also be able to catch some geminids, some late geminids uh, yet this week. Eh, I don't bank on it, especially with the weather here. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so not a whole lot of planet, a little bit of Mars, not a whole lot of planet. Um but what else do we have? We have some of the brightest stars. Uh, the majority of the top 20 bright stars are out in the wintertime. And we have some pretty well-known constellations. So I'm going to go ahead and set this. Uh, set this for mid-ish January. Um, there goes the moon. We'll, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go past the moon so we don't have a moon out there. <clears throat> So uh, late January, this is actually early February. So we are well into winter. Um, and one of the most recognized constellations in the night sky is Orion. So a lot of folks are familiar with that. Orion has the bright stars Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse. I like to say Betelgeuse, it's more fun. Rigel. And then we have all these other really bright stars. Sirius, Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. If you're far enough south, you can also see the second brightest star in the night sky. If I move through time here, I'm pretty sure we cannot see it from New York. But if you're further south, if you're down in Florida, Arizona, Georgia, maybe, um, one, go vote if you're in Georgia. And two, um, there's a bright star, Canopus. It's, it's when Orion is highest in the sky. Um, I might point that one out at uh, some skies uh, some week in the future. But Canopus, the second brightest star in the night sky. Also, top 20, we have Procyon, we have uh, Capella, and we have the twins Gemini and Aldebaran. So like all these stars, like <laughs> so many kind of clumped right together. And it's kind of odd because you see it's in this kind of band. I don't know, this fuzzy, almost, I don't want to say milky because milk would be more white. This is more of like a, well, it's kind of a hazy blue as shown in Stellarium. Um, but yeah, that, this, this little way of milk. Um, so it's like along the Milky Way. Uh, yes, that's our winter Milky Way, which is not as bright as a summer Milky Way. 
Um, so the Milky Way isn't as bright, but we still have uh, more than half of the top 20 bright stars out at a given time in the winter. So that's kind of neat. So what do I mean when I'm talking about this Milky Way thing? So I want to pop over to open space so that we can see kind of what's happening in 3D when we're looking at our different seasonal skies, winter sky versus the summer sky or really any other sky. All right. So to do that, let's go ahead and uh, get away from Earth. Uh, so we will zoom, zoom, zoom out away from Earth. Um, you can see the orbits of the planets, goodbye planets. And actually, before I get too far out, I do want to turn on some constellation lines as markers so that we have a sense of how far away from the Earth we're getting. So there we have familiar constellations. All right. You can see some of the kind of red lines. Um, as we get further away, kind of outside of our solar system, and then we see the nearby stars zipping in and more distant stars. So again, these lines are kind of connecting some of the brighter stars in our night sky <clears throat> that we use to form constellations. And that's where we are in the galaxy. So now we're seeing top down ish, there's no up in space, uh, but a view of our galaxy. All right, so we're not the center. We're a little ways out, and eh, maybe a little over halfway out on one of the spiral arms. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, because we're not in the center, it's not going to be, when we look up in the, at the Milky Way in our night sky, it's not going to be completely symmetric all the way around, right? So when we're looking in towards the center, we're looking through a thicker cross section of the Milky Way. And when we're looking towards like kind of the outer part of the arm that we're on, we're looking through a thinner cross section. So it turns out that for the Earth, when uh, it's winter in the northern hemisphere, the Earth is kind of over on this side of the sun. So we're looking towards the thinner part of the Milky Way, uh, the outer part of the arm that we're on, and vice versa, right? So in the summer, we're looking in more towards the center. So we have a thinner, th a thinner slice of Milky Way that we're looking through. So that's why in the winter, um, our Milky Way is fainter than it is in the summertime. And then spring and fall, it's kind of in between. So that's the Milky Way. That's why we don't have a super bright Milky Way, but there's still lots of really cool stuff. All right. So again, galaxies, clusters, and nebulae. Galaxies, I may or may not get to, and honestly, there aren't that many great galaxies in the winter sky. They're more like in the fall, but there's some good ones in the winter. So if I have time tonight, we'll get to those. But I want to focus on the clusters and nebulae because those are really like <gasps> the best of the best. And you have to see these and make sure you have binoculars or telescope or something so you can check these out. So let's start with, uh, you know, the sparkly things because <laughs> I like the sparkly things. That, that's I guess that's kind of why I do this. It's for the sparkles. So we have a couple different types of star clusters. Um, first, let's take a look at where the open clusters are. Um, and we hopefully will make it past the open clusters because honestly, there's there's just a lot of open clusters. Um, so if you zoom in here, like all these green dots, let's see if I can make these a little bit brighter or a little bit bigger. Um, yeah, I think we can go green dots. All right, green dots, bigger green dots. Oh, that's too big, <laughs> even for green dots. Okay, so these green dots, these are representing the open clusters. So when you notice that the open clusters, these are groups of you know dozens to hundreds, maybe a thousand stars or so that all kind of form from the same big cloud of gas. So they're all kind of like loosely bound, relatively young out in space, hanging out like you do. So those are mostly in the plane of the galaxy, not so many like way up above or way down below the plane and fairly evenly distributed throughout. So those we see all the time, um, any season of the year and uh, all mostly along the plane of the Milky Way. So some examples, which ones might be my favorites? I know you're wondering. So let me tell you, if we pop back over to Stellarium. And again, we can see the Milky Way kind of stretching along here. So it's going kind of off the back of uh, the big dog, Canis Major, through the invisible unicorn in here. Uh, that's Monoceros. And then up above Orion, kind of between Orion and Gemini. Let me just put up some labels 
um, to make it a little bit more clear. Uh, labels, those. Um, and then up into Auriga. So it's a thinner Milky Way. Again, not super, super thick. Um, but some of the best clusters, some of the best open clusters really in the whole night sky. Um, so yeah, I, can't, I can't even pick top 10. I might have to stick with 15. Um, some, I, I don't know if I've already mentioned, between Cassiopeia, so remember the jaws, om nom nom, nom nom nom. Uh, even here, you can kind of see like this faint fuzzy spot that's like actually a double cluster. So this is also out kind of in the fall. It's been out for a little while now. But if we zoom in there, it's basically two for one. Um, super fun clusters that we can see uh, just basically following the the lower part of uh, of Cassiopeia, that lower lump, um, down towards the crooked witch hat of Perseus. You all know how to find Algol because I told you to look for that. Um, and just kind of tracking along the Milky Way there. One, there's a whole mess of open clusters in Cassiopeia. That's one of my favorite constellations to kind of hunt around for. Um, but that's almost more fall. So this is kind of a fall thing, also an autumn thing. But this is really beautiful in binoculars, um, almost too big for some telescopes because you're usually only going to see one group or the other group. Um, but if you have binoculars, that is a fantastic pair of clusters. Um, so the, the double cluster near Perseus, um, it's one that you can kind of bank on. Um, some of the well-known ones, we have the Pleiades. I know we've gone flying through the Pleiades. I was tempted to do that tonight. It's just like, no, we do that like every month, it feels like. The Hyades, that's the face of Taurus the bull. So both of those, both the Pleiades, looks like a little mini dipper there. Um, so that's kind of writing on the back of Taurus the bull. Let's see if we can actually turn on a cartoon here. Does it look like a bull? Yeah, that's a bull definitely bull. Okay. And then the, the high Hades, um, are the face of the bull with Aldebaran kind of like the eye of the bull. So those are two very close or relatively close open clusters, very young stars in there. Um, moving on over, um, there's some really great <laughs> clusters, some kind of hidden gems, so to speak. Um, the one that I wanted to check out, I think, Oh, I might miss it. I might, I might actually have to cheat and use the, uh, this one. Oh yeah, there's the one. <laughs> okay. So actually these two, I wasn't sure if they actually had the 37 cluster in here. Um, this one is really fantastic. Um, I think if you have even a low power telescope, this is a really fun one. Why would it be called the 37 cluster? So there's M37, which is another really great cluster in the sky, which, uh, we'll get to that in a bit. But the 37 cluster is called the 37 cluster. I think it's actually an asterism um, because it looks like a 37. So if you zoom in here and you have to use a little bit of imagination, but the stars actually make like a backwards. There's like a three and a seven and there's there's words in the way, but <laughs> that's a 37. So it's almost kind of eerie. It's like you're, you know, zipping around the sky, scanning the sky with your telescope. And all of a sudden it's like, hi there, or hello world, like written out in stars, like who put that there? Um, so just kind of a fun thing. Uh, we don't really see a lot of alphanumeric um, patterns in the sky. Usually we kind of make up blobs and uh, blobs and animals and things. Uh, so the other one that's over there that's very seasonal, the Christmas tree cluster. <laughs> Uh, because it's out like right by, well, kind of another Christmassy asterism we'll get to in a moment. So Christmas tree cluster, if you get a chance to look at this, uh, really great in telescopes. Uh, you can kind of pick it out in binoculars because it has a bit of nebulosity and is one really bright star. So I'll let you see if you can figure out where the Christmas tree is. <laughs> um, I, I think different people say a different way. I see it mostly upside down, right? So like that's the stem and there's the tree and it looks a little bit better than my tree. My tree is too big this year. I didn't have enough lights. So like there's dark patches in my tree, almost like a dark nebula. Oh my goodness. I have a nebula tree. I just realized. So, so Christmas tree cluster, really wonderful. That one's a little bit trickier to find. The 37 cluster was right along like in kind of the elbow pit of Orion. 
the Christmas tree cluster is kind of like off in the Netherlands between <laughs> between um, between Beetlejuice and Procyon. Um, the the prettiest thing between Beetlejuice and Procyon is this Rosette Nebula, which has a cluster associated with it. We may or may not get to that because I'm just kind of really excited about all these clusters. Um, but I'll try and tone it down a little bit so we can get to some nebulae. The other must-see clusters, I would say, uh, M46 and M47 uh, over here off of the back of the big dog. So again, if you're just scanning this part of the sky with binoculars, M46 and M47 show up. Um, 47 is labeled here. 46 is the little one that's right next to it. And the cool thing about 46 is that it has kind of a a, a uh, um, a planetary nebula, so like an old kind of dead star that looks like it's embedded. It's just same of line of sight, uh, I believe, because really the, the cluster is going to be actually new stars. But if you can pick out M46 uh, in a telescope, see if you can find that planetary nebula in there as well. So that's that's a real gem. The other open clusters that you really need to check out are further up in Auriga. I kind of skipped over them earlier, but it's a, like a favorite little trio uh, to kind of just paint along here. Um, they're kind of like three in a row. So we have uh, M, M38, M36, M37. Um, so those are, those are kind of fun, uh, kind of from easiest to hardest as you move kind of from the heart of Auriga to the kind of eastern part of it. Um, but those are those are some great clusters as well. So those are all the open clusters. There's there's a lot more, <laughs> uh, but I'll try not to I'll try to move on to some other things as well besides clusters. Um, also, there's just some interesting stars. I have to say, my favorite multiple star system is out in the winter time. Uh, it's in the constellation uh, Eridanus, right? So this is a river that starts off near uh, near. The hunter's foot, so near Orion's foot, and it twists and curves all around and way down into the south and ends at a very bright star, Achenar. But in the bend of the river, we have some stars, Omicron 1, Omicron 2, Iod and Kia, they're like, I guess the shells or something, I don't know, the eggshells, something. Um, but the really cool thing, um, I believe this is. Omicron 1, Omicron 2. Uh, Omicron 2, Erdani, is a, a triple star system. So most of the multiple star systems we see, you see like two stars or, you know, with a double-double in, um, in Lyra, we see four stars. But Omicron 2, Erdani, if you can pick this one out, see there's Bead, there's Kiad. Um, this one is a real gem. So it has... Uh, kind of a bright, more sun-like star. And then it has two kind of dwarf stars. And I don't know if we're actually going to see them in here. Guess not. Um, but one is uh, one's actually a, a, a red dwarf. So it's like one of the brightest red dwarfs in the whole night sky. You can actually see it because this is a relatively close star. Um, look up Vulcans. And I'm just going to leave that there for all the Trotky fans. Um, but yeah, really cool. So one of my favorite multiple star systems, a lot of amazing open clusters. Let's check back into open space and see if we can't spy some other types of clusters, shall we? So back to open space. Now they've made a mess of Stellarium. <laughs> back to open space. So remember, again, we're kind of looking out at just like where we are in the galaxy, where this stuff is, so you can figure out where we're oriented. And we saw that the open clusters were kind of all over the place. The other type of cluster, the more sparkly one, um, those are the globular clusters. And those are not as many of those. Um, so those are the yellow pentagons, right? So we had green dots, now we have yellow pentagons. So the yellow pentagons, the globular clusters, those are groups of hundreds of thousands to a million or so stars. And those tend to be a lot further away from us. So those are going to be like way out, like up above or down below the plane of the galaxy, not necessarily in the plane. So if we're looking through the plane, we don't necessarily see as many of those. And frankly, there's not as many really great ones out in the winter. So the best ones of those are more like 
summer, fall, but the winter sky, if we kind of pan around and just look and see, right, if we're trying to look out towards the outer part of the arm, like you see, there's, there's not a whole lot out here as far as yellow pentagons, right? There are more in this way, but there are globular clusters. And if you're fixing for a globular cluster, um, you can find one below Orion. There's a cute little constellation, Lepus the hare. And down below Lepus, so from New York, it's pretty far south. So it doesn't get super, super high above the horizon. But down below Lepus, we have the globular cluster M79. I'm going to ask Stellarium for help. Yep, there we go. Um, and of course, the red circles, galaxies. Great. So M79, that's your best bet, I would say. Um, if anyone has any other favorites, feel free to just like, you know, shout it out. Um, but M79, that's a, a nice little globular cluster, a nice really dense core there. And it's not super hard to find with a telescope because most people know Orion. Um, Lepus is a little bit fainter. Uh, but if you can find, if you can see the bright stars in Lepus, then you can, should be able to make your way down to that globular cluster, M79. Little ball of sparkle. All right, so those are the sparkly things. Uh, a multiple star system, so many open clusters. I haven't even gone over them all. And uh, and the globular cluster, not as many of those, kind of lacking, but that's okay. The winter sky makes up for it in other respects. Um, I kind of mentioned not a lot of galaxies. I don't think we're going to get to that anyway. But if we go back to open space, we can see the other super fun thing we have in the winter sky are lots and lots of nebulae. All right. So when astronomers say nebula, what we mean is like a huge cloud of gas in space. And there's a couple of different types of those. Um, one, I already kind of briefly mentioned the planetary nebula. So little blue dots. <laughs> Um, actually I think they're triangles. So the blue triangles, those are kind of leftovers from small to medium sized stars, kind of like our sun. This is what our sun will do someday. They tend to be very round or spherical in nature. And I, I mentioned there's the one that's in, um, uh, kind of embedded or along the same light line of sight as the open cluster M46, uh, in the constellation Canis Major. So if we kind of look towards the outer part of the galaxy, like out here again, we can see there are a few. Um, one of the coolest ones, I would have to say, is the Eskimo Nebula. Um, probably shouldn't call it that anymore, so <laughs> I'm just going to look at the actual number. Uh, but there's a really beautiful, uh, a really beautiful um, planetary nebula in the constellation Gemini. So I want to pop back over and talk about that just briefly. I'm not going to get, <laughs> why not get to the other types of nebula tonight? Um, but if we look back up at Gemini, um, so we have Castor and Pollux. So basically, if you follow the belt, uh, not the belt, but follow from Rigel through the belt, past Betelgeuse, and go up, 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 you'll come to uh, Castor and Pollux. Um, and so on this eastern twin kind of off of the hip we have this little grouping of stars and then over there near that little grouping of stars is this really beautiful nebula uh ngc we're going to call it ngc 2392 all right so the really cool thing about this nebula it's it's a really fun test for what astronomers call averted vision uh, some people make fun of us and say, oh, it's just averted imagination. Like you're just imagining stuff. Like, no, it's really there. Thank you very much. So uh, I think I need to just pause time real quick so that the, <laughs> the nebula doesn't run away from me. Pause. Um, but what you're looking at when you see here, you see kind of the, the outer part of it and then like this brighter inner part and even like the bright star in the center. So not all planetary nebula um, were able to see the the, the bright central star that kind of flung out all this gas. So the cool thing about this one is that for most uh, amateur sized telescopes, if we're looking directly at it in the telescope, then kind of this, this haze around here, the nebulosity kind of fades away 
and you just see the bright star. But then if you use your averted, averted vision, meaning if you look off to the side so that you're basically seeing you're seeing the, the nebula with your peripheral vision, um, it turns out you have more light detectors, more of the rods in your peripheral vision, and more of the color detectors, the cone, more in your central vision. So if you're trying to see faint things, we look off to the side. We use what we call averted vision. So I would look like way over here or up here, not directly at it. But then in your peripheral vision, this nebula really pops out. So it's kind of neat being like right on the edge of, uh, of brightness, just the right brightness so that if you look directly at it, it almost disappears. And then if you look away, it pops right back out. So there's another nebula that does that. It's out more in the summertime. It's called the blinking nebula. It's off of the one, the, the wings of Cygnus, the swan. Um, but if you're trying to find something in the winter sky that does something similar, that's your best bet, the NGC uh, 2392. So check that out up in Gemini. And last but not least, I am just going to mention um, probably what <laughs> a lot of the, the winter sky is known for is not the planetary nebulae. Um, it does have one of the brightest supernova remnants in the whole sky. There aren't very many of those. Um, let me just pull our supernova remnants are somewhere. Um, there they are. Supernova remnants, not uh, not nearly as uh, as plentiful as uh, some of our others. But the winter sky has probably the, the brightest and most famous supernova remnant that is the Crab Nebula in, uh, in Taurus. So we'll get more into that in, uh, in a bit. Those are also mostly in the plane of the galaxy, all right? So you're going to be kind of scanning along the plane of the galaxy for those. So supernova remnants and, of course, the H2 region. So we'll just quickly visit. There's so many amazing H2 regions. I kind of alluded to the Rosette Nebula earlier. Um, the Christmas tree cluster also has kind of um, a bit of nebulosity around it that's really pretty. <clears throat> but just to kind of wrap up, um, we'll go ahead and just stop by probably the most famous of each, um, the Crab Nebula up here. So that was actually recorded in uh, going supernova in 1054. So a supernova is just what it sounds like. It's the leftovers, the remnant of a star that went supernova. <laughs> so up by one of the uh, horns of Taurus, the bull, if you stretch it all the way up to this bright star up here, this blob <clears throat> is the Crab Nebula M1. It's not just a star there. There's a nebula. So this is one of the most widely studied objects in astronomy. It's been imaged in all the different wavelengths. Um, pretty amazing. Uh, so definitely bright enough for amateur telescopes to pick out, like without using um, any time-lapse photography. Again, there's another one kind of in the summer sky that's much, much bigger, more diffuse, and it's actually split apart into different pieces. Uh, but this crab, that's one of the younger, brighter ones. So that is a must-see if you have a telescope and you're going to tour around the winter sky. The other, of course, which you can see with the naked eye, with binoculars, uh, we all know and love <clears throat> this wonderful star-forming region um, below the belt of Orion in the uh, sword, <laughs> all right? So if you look up at Orion, you know, there's the three stars in the belt, boom, 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 all the time. And then down below that, you have this sword, which kind of looks like three stars, but really the middle star, if you look a little more closely with your eye or good pair of binoculars, it's actually this gorgeous nebulous region um, where stars are being born. So that's stellar nursery. Um, it's actually very, like, there's all these, like, different pieces of the nebula and related nebula that are all, like, kind of intertwined here. But this is the main piece, right? So M42, the Orion Nebula, um, stars actively being born. There's amazing Hubble simulations where you can go and see them, like, flying around in 3D because they've imaged it and figured out the different distances to the different pieces. So there's stars that are in there that are kind of glowing and heating up the gas. Uh, so that it, it, it fluoresces and uh, giving off these wonderful colors. So you won't see the colors in, uh, in binoculars or even in a telescope, it looks slightly orangish, not this kind of pinky hue of the hydrogen gas that's in there. Uh, 
Um, but we can see some of the baby stars, the trapezium are part of like a little star cluster that are forming from this gas as it collapses into form new baby stars. Long process, that's another story, but that's definitely one of the objects that you would have to see this winter. So I'll be raging about some of these and uh, putting out challenges, but just to get you kind of excited and looking forward to all the wonderful things that we have to, to, to look forward to in the winter sky. Um, some really great constellations, and we'll learn to find a lot of them using Orion, which a lot of folks are already familiar with. Um, even if you can just pick out the belt of Orion, we'll be looking at how to find other things using the belt, um, and then some, and then finding a lot of cool clusters along the, the winter Milky Way, even though it's fainter, there's just so many wonderful clusters in there. A couple really neat multiple star systems, and of course, the really gorgeous nebulae. So that's... <laughs> more than I really had time for tonight. Um, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for joining me for this uh, little tour around our celestial neighborhood. Again, I'm Irene Pease, your friendly neighborhood astronomer. Uh, I'm so glad you were able to join me tonight. Uh, I get it, hope you get a chance to get outside and see the planets this week. Uh, again, it'll be a while before that happens again. So, uh, and join me again next week for the uh, mission of the month if you're if you're doing something astronomy themed for Christmas that's that's what we're doing we're doing a Christmas astronomy as our mission of the month so thanks so much for joining me for the tour clear skies everyone be safe out there and uh, wear a mask <laughs>